It's okay, you can laugh. <laughs> uh, really glad to be able to <clears throat> speak this morning, to share with you some of the things that God's been uh, working with us or with me about. We've been in this, thank you, we've been in this um, series on um, world view, um, and um, how should I say, uh, all week long this stuff goes around and around in my head, all week long, and it's, it's great. I probably have preached this sermon a hundred times this week, different every time. It doesn't count, though, until you sit down and put it down on paper. That's when it counts. And so by then, I'm so confused, I have to figure the whole thing out. How many of you, <coughs> um, well, I want to talk to you about a very simple subject. It's called why. Why? Now, I know that, <laughs> I know that every one of you have asked that question at least once. Right? The reason I know that you've asked that question at least once is you've all been a child at one time or another. And you've always wanted to know why. I, I think knowing why is important. It helps us to know the importance of how when we know why we're doing something. And that's one of the reasons why children will want to ask questions. Uh, there's a cartoon by mm, Calvin and Hobbes. Why do you suppose that we are here, asks Calvin. And uh, because we walked here. How did you get here anyway? And no, how, why, why are we here on earth? Because earth can support life. Good enough reason. No, no, no. I mean, why are we here, any, anywhere. Why do we exist? And the answer is because we were born. And he just says, forget it, I'm done. He was um, on the part of asking why and finally gave up because he didn't get his answer. But here's the thing. The reason that we ask why is because we think that there's a reason why things happen. We believe that there's a purpose as to why things happen. And we would like to know what that reason is and what that, uh, that motivation is. We want to know what the reasons are for why things are the way they are. Now, would you agree with me on this, that there is a reason for why things are the way they are? Is that a fair statement to make? Okay, okay, good, good. I just wanted to check. I, I thought it was probably pretty good. I thought it was probably a pretty good chance there's a reason why things are the way they are. I just wanted to see. You. <laughs> because <clears throat> there, it seems to me, you know, and again, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, all right? I, I, you, can, you can say something. You don't have to just sit there. But it seems to me there's something that in, inside of us that leads us to believe there are answers to question in life. Even children know that. Little children know that. They're always asking why. A mother might tell the child, don't touch the stove. Why? Because it's hot. Why? Because the fire is on. Yeah, but how is that going to hurt me? And Pretty soon the mom says, well, here, check it out. <laughs> no, 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 no. She never has to do that. You know why? Do you know why? <laughs> because the kid's going to try it on his own. It's gonna have to, they're going to have to know why. They've got to find out why. And, and <clears throat> so we might be asking ourselves, why is this my reality? Why is this my reality? The what is going on around me. And we might uh, ask a whole bunch of questions at times, and these questions might get to be repetitious, or they might just be obnoxious. Sometimes we ask questions until 
we realize we're not going to get an answer. And then when we, we're not going to get an answer to our why question, we go, who cares? What do I care? I'm going to go do whatever because nobody told me why or why not. And so it's important, especially when uh, our children are growing up and they become teenagers and young adults and they ask questions that we do our best to give an answer. We also may ask questions and get an answer that only opens up more questions. That's oftentimes the way it is when little children ask a question and you, and they say why, and you give them an answer and they'll just say why, and they just keep saying why. <laughs> why, why are we here? I mean, no, why are we on this earth? I mean, why, what, what we, and, and it seems like, li like life can become an endless round of questions. You get one question answered, and there's another one. And all you have to do is say, why? Other times, we might get an answer to our why question that just lacks reasonable support. We're going, that's nuts. That's crazy. Like, somebody might, you might ask a question, well, where did we come from? And how did this all begin? And somebody tells you, it started with a great big explosion. Well, how did that happen? Uh, and, or why did that happen? And, and finally, there's kind of like, well, we, what can we tell you? So we kind of go through life without getting the, uh, a reasonable answer to a good question. I, I've even had this happen. <clears throat> not that I did it. Not that I didn't want to do it. <laughs> But we may be told to stop asking questions about why. We might want to say, hey, shut up. That's the way things are. Just deal with it, would you? You've never done that, have you? <laughs> you know? Uh, and even if you haven't ever done it, I know you wanted to. You just wanted them to stop asking these questions. Well, <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me give you some reality here. This past week, there was a mass shooting again. Uh, I have a rather um, obnoxious comic cartoon. Another mass shooting. I've already seen that one way too many times. You know, it's sad, but that's true. It's true. Did you know that in the United States, this past mass shooting that took place in Thousand Oaks, California, 11 were shot dead. We, we might ask ourselves, why? But did you know that in the past 311 days, this is number 307? Did you know that's almost one a day? That was astounding to me. Now, I have to, I, I have to say that um, I know where the source is this, and, and I, I, but I couldn't find this information anywhere else. So I'm going to just tell you that hey, this is from a newspaper reporting this. Might be true or might not be true, but I, 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 I tend to, to look for other uh, sources before I put out information like that, but you know what? I'm not surprised. <clears throat> 328 dead, 1,251 injured. Why? Why? And, and that should be the question that we're asking is, why, I why is it happening? At the Warriors game this past week, a reporter asked uh, the coach, Steve Kerr, what his feelings were about uh, the mass shooting that took place. They were getting ready to have another moment of silence. Steve Kerr's reply is, we'll have a moment of silence tonight. We had a moment of silence last week. We'll probably have a moment of silence next week. Look what he says. That's the reality until we do something about it. Why is this our reality? Is it our re reality simply because we don't know what to do about it? Or is there something deeper? Is there something else that's causing this? And, and here's the thing. Now, I'm, I, I don't own a gun. I've never owned a gun. I have shotguns. I'm, no, not that I have shotguns, <laughs> but I have taken guns and fired them. There you go. All right? <clears throat> Boy, don't ever tell anybody in this country that I have shotguns, all right? 
Okay. <clears throat> but um, here's the thing. Some, some say adamantly and indeed with broken hearts, this woman was saying, we just have to stop the guns. We have to get rid of the guns. And, and some believe that stricter gun control or by banning guns will take care of the problem. It might alleviate the problem, but that's far too simplistic. Because here's the problem. As you know, in this country, guns are outlawed. Does it mean there are no guns? No. It just simply means only the outlaws have guns, the ones who are not looking to keep the law anyway. And generally, a law-abiding pers law person isn't going to be using a gun in, in the wrong way. But here's, here's wh what I would like to say, that if someone wants to kill lots of people, they will find a way. Even if it means hijacking a commercial airliner and flying it into a building. If somebody wants to kill a lot of people, they will find a way. Now, granted, I will admit, it's a little less easy if you don't have so much such easy access to a, a revolver or a gun. But we need to understand something. Guns are not what kill people. People kill people. This is what we have to do. This is why we, we, we do ourselves a disservice when we see these mass shootings and we quickly say, we've got to get rid of the guns. That might help, but if you don't take care of the problem with the people who want to kill people, then that problem won't go away, folks. It just won't go away. So we ask the question, why? Well, we live in Taiwan. We feel fairly safe and secure living in this, uh, in this country. So I did a little Google search. Murders in Taiwan. Here's what came up. A headline from the United Daily News saying, Taiwan saw record 14 murder cases in May. That's this past May. That's May 2018. We might say, 14 murder cases? Are you kidding me? Chicago does that every day. <clears throat> so we might think that we're okay with that. One of the reporters said this, they had never covered so many grisly cases in such a short period of time, and that, his words, it was truly frightening. Truly frightening. As it turns out, you may remember this, or you may know, you may recall this, but in May, from May 27 to May 31, there were four extremely grisly murders. One was an old man, 67-year-old man in Taoyuan, who confessed to stabbing his wife to death and beheading her and disemboweling her after she asked him for a divorce. You don't need guns to do that. There's something sick. There's something that's wrong. On May 28th, a boxer from Taipei City hung himself after allegedly murdering his girlfriend and disposing of her dismembered body in seven trash bags. It takes a lot more evil wickedness to do that than to go into a crowded building and begin shooting people. I'm not go trying to make a level of goodness or badness. I'm not trying to make that. I'm just simply saying to you, wicked is wicked. Evil is evil. On May 28th, a popular Taiwanese online streamer was stabbed to death by her ex-boyfriend using a fruit knife. Then on May 31st, an archery teacher murdered his student after she rejected his sexual advances, chopped her body up, and distributed it into nine different, nine different places. The thing is about that, about this, these are people murdering other people whom they knew and who they were once relationally involved with. Do we need any more reality, folks? I ask you the question, why this reality? What's going on? Is it going to get any better? It isn't atomic bombs 
It's not poisonous gas. It's not artillery. It's people that kill people. The reality is this. We're the problem. We are the problem. And there is no possible way of solving the problem if we don't look in the mirror and say, we're the problem. We think we can solve the problem by just getting rid, rid of the instruments of murder. If that's the case, we have a lot of different things we need to get rid of. But it's the heart that's wicked. It's the heart where the problem lies. We also, not wanting to take the responsibility on ourselves, look to governments and look to our government to give us an, a, a, some sort of protection. Protection so that we can lead a life of liberty, lead a life of safety. And um, in the American government, there is a sentence which I was told is the most well-known English sentence in the world. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And do you agree with that? Any amens? I know maybe not that many Americans here, but it's okay because it's, it's not new to us. We're not the ones who came, the, the founding fathers who wanted to get away from the repressive uh, uh, monarch, uh, kingdom, king government there and wanted to get away from it. They're the ones who came up with this. John Locke, uh, they're not actually the ones who came out. John Locke argued in the 17th century that humans, humans have some natural rights and that these natural rights were not given to them through a government, but instead they're given by God. These rights were given by God. That is in, in, in our Declaration of Independence. This is what gives us what we believe to be the right to rebel against this government which was refusing, refusing to give the people uh, the ability to live their life to exercise liberty, and to pursue happiness. And I would say to you that all sounds well and good, but there's a problem. The problem is this. When you take God, when you take God out of the picture, because according to the sentence that is in our Declaration of Independence, it states that these rights are endowed by their creator. Therefore, the creator is the one who gives the rights. But the creator is also one who can not give the rights. The problem comes when we take the creator out of the picture. And everybody insists that these are my unalienable, unalienable rights. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. So, let's ask the question. What makes you happy? What if it really makes you happy to strap some guns on your body and to walk into a bar full of, full of young people and start shooting? What if that is what you get charged? You just think, man, what a, what a thrill that's going to be. Does that give you a right? Now, I, I, I'm not going to go too deep into this thing. There's a whole lot of things that go along with it. But what about the pursuit of liberty? I can be free and I can do whatever I want to. And, 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 and the, the, the right to be free. And the right to live life. But what if those things that, I, that, that, that give me satisfaction, or what if the way that I live my life is contrary to the way you want to live your life? So here's my point. How then do we judge somebody who says, hey, I get my kicks shooting people, killing people. In fact, is I believe that I'm serving God by commandeering a commercial airline and flying it into a building to see how many infidels we can murder. 
Does he have a right to do that? Even fulfilling what his religion seems to be telling him? When, when, when we take God out of the picture, who are you to tell me what makes me happy? And who am I to tell you what makes you happy and that you can't do that? And so this is a problem that we have here when we talk about the reality, this reality. And, and we, div- we divorce it, and we wash God clean from it, and we try to teach our children morals, we try to teach them right and wrong and so forth. But when we take God out of the picture, now mom and dad, you still have authority because you're mom and dad. But when children grow up to be adults and they don't agree with you, what are you going to do? Where do you stand? What's your authority? So it seems to me that an answer to the why that we live in this reality is because we've denied God. We've told God, hey, check out, buddy. We don't need you. We can do this on our own. And you know what? As we saw a few weeks ago, God says, all right, if you can do it on your own, have it your way. Have it your way. When we see our, our world caught up in such a mess as, as this, and <clears throat> we need to ask ourselves whether or not these unalienable rights are actually tenable, are actually something we can claim without coming or having been given to us through a creator. I think it's fair to say that these rights are only tenable when we recognize a creator, that they're, according to the writers of the Declaration of Independence, they're given by God. I don't believe they're necessarily guaranteed by God. So let me give you an example, all right? In the Bible, you've... You may have heard of a guy named Job. Even if you haven't read read the Bible, you probably have heard about a guy named Job. And in fact is, when uh, we are facing a whole lot of difficulties, we'll oftentimes say, I'm failing, I'm facing Job's trials. I'm being persecuted like Job. When you go to the the book of Job and you look at verses, uh, chapters one and two, in chapters one and two, there's a conversation that takes place between God and Satan unbeknownst to Job. And God says to Satan, Satan, have you seen my servant Job, how upright and good he is? And Satan goes, of course he is. Look what you've given to him. You've given him all the cattle, the sheep, you've given him lands, you've given him seven sons and three daughters. These sons and daughters, they gather together on each one on their birthday, their celebration, They have great feasts together. They have wonderful times. Job's happy. They're happy. Life's good, of course. Satan taunts God, actually, and uh, says, if you let me at him, he'll curse you. So, Satan and God make a bet. There's a wager. God says, all right, I'll let you have it your way, except you can't touch him. When you read the story in chapter 2, his body is attacked. Job loses every single possession. Job loses seven sons and three daughters whom they have put their life into. They're adults now. They've seen them through. And in one fell swoop, they're gone. Chapter 2 tells us that Mrs. Job comes in and says to Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Why do you hold on to this God? Why would you even want to? I, you know, I, <laughs> I read a whole bunch of stuff from people who are condemning Mrs. Job. But I want to tell you something. I think she's being a very honest woman. What woman wouldn't just cry out in anger at the loss of the seeming ridiculous and foolish loss of her offspring. She doesn't know what's going on, and yet her husband, he won't even cry out against God. 
And though you read through the book, going back and forth between Job and his quote-unquote friends, and uh, <clears throat> you get to the end of the book, and Job hears from God. God asks him a whole lot of questions. Job is really having a struggle over here, and then God has this, has this uh, dialogue with Job, and Job realizes that, you know, humans cannot compare themselves with God. There's a big difference. We yield to God, and he says to God, I yield to you. God says to him, then pray for your friends who were so mean to you, and after you pray for your friends, I'll restore everything double, except for his children. He was given, though, in return, seven new sons and three new daughters. Interesting note that there's a specific mention that Job's three daughters are the most beautiful in the whole land. So here's, here's the point I want to make. God took away his unalienable rights, didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't God take away everything except a little sliver of life? His body was filled with boils and pain, and, and, and he was in agony. He lost his children. His wife is turning on him. He, what does he have? Life? No. Liberty? To do what? The pursuit of happiness? Everything he has is gone. But I think this is important for us to understand. While we may be demanding our rights, it was God's blessing that he poured out on, Joseph, uh, on Job. We may be too desirous, or I want my rights, rather than saying, God, rights or no rights, I just want you to bless me. And crying out to God, say, God, your blessing means more than anything, more than freedom, more than life. More than the pursuit of happiness, God, I just want your blessings. I say that because it puts a different perspective on things. Rather than demanding and say, I have a right for this and I have a right for that, it's simply saying, God, your blessings. Not because I can demand them, but because I so need your blessings. And then I want us to look at another place when we talk about these unalienable rights. Please, please, don't, um, please don't think I've become an anarchist or anything like, these, okay, like that, all right? <clears throat> but I do want to look at this from a Christian point of view because I fear that oftentimes we take things that are given to us good, with good intentions. And instead of asking what, where does this come from in the Bible, Look at the sacrifice of Jesus. Did Jesus, as the Son of God, demand his rights to be recognized as to who he is? He came into Jerusalem pro pro being proclaimed as being the king of the Jews. He was riding a, a white donkey and, or, 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 and a, a colt, and they laid down their cloaks and, and outer clothing before him so that Jesus... His donkey didn't even have to uh, uh, touch the ground. That's only done for kings and monarchs. And now Jesus, as he's praying in the Garden of Eden, he's begging his father to let this pass. Not a mention of, hey, I'm your son. I've got some rights here. Instead, he yields. He gives. He says, Father, not my will be done. Not my will be done, but thine. Jesus gave up his unalienable rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. To do what? To die for me. To die for you. So that you might be able to experience life and happiness and joy. In our story... This shows that God loves people. God was willing to give up everything because he loves humans. He made us in his image. He made us in his likeness because he wants to have fellowship with us. 
And the reason that we can lose that fellowship is because we're too concerned about getting what is mine. Whereas it's God's sacrifice, God's sacrifice that gives us the gift of life, life with God. So I want you to turn to uh, John, chapter John chapter 3. And here it's spelled right out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment, the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. I, I look at this, this passage of Scripture here, and I think, wow, this is just talking about our world today. It's, it's saying God loves this world. He, he didn't make it this way. And he's saying that whoever believes in him, follows him, trusts him, that... Uh, they should not perish but have eternal life. So when, you, when we look at, the, at this list here, this is our story of reality. This is our story of reality. This is what we look at as being real in life. We see that there is a God. We start with a God. You know, nowhere in the Bible is there any attempt to t try and prove God. You can't prove God. You can't prove God. You know what? You can't prove there is no God. And so here we are at this impasse because we're going back and forth and knocking heads with people because they don't believe there is a God and we believe there is a God, but they can't prove there's no God and you can't prove there is a God. It's by faith and, and, and that we look at it and there's the re reasons for it, but here it is. God loved the world. He didn't want this world that's killing one another. He gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So we have God. We have the world. That's humans. That's us. There's Jesus. There's the cross. He died on the cross. And he rose again. There's the resurrection. That's what we're looking for. So we see God made the world in perfection. Uh, he made man to have perfect fellowship and communion with him. We sinned. We sinned. The world became broken and God came and became a man in Jesus to pay the price that we would have to pay in order that he might save us. He did that on the cross, and after <clears throat> being killed on that cross three days later, he rose again to resurrection, and we have a promise. That's what he says right here, but that we have eternal life. We have the promise of eternal life. That's pretty amazing. It's, it's <clears throat> incredible. But this is our story of reality. It's our story of reality. You say, well, how do you know, Pastor? I mean, how do you know the reality of God if we can't prove him? I've, I'm, not, I'm not a, how should I say, I'm not a physicist. But since I started going into this stuff about the world and all that kind of stuff. I've been reading a lot of physics and it seems like the deeper you get into it, the more nebulous it gets. It's like there's a whole lot of things we can't see, but we know that it's there. Let me say that again. There's a whole lot of things that physicists cannot see, but they know that it's there. I've never seen the wind. Have you? Sometimes it picks up dust and I see the dust moving, but I've never seen the wind but I can see what it does. I know that it's there. I've never actually seen anger, but I can see what anger does to people. And we can talk and say what we want to about love, but you can't see love. Love has to be expressed. Love has to be shown, done, something. So there's a lot of things that we don't see, but we still believe. 
But why do we need this story of reality? We, and this is why we're doing this, folks. Because we need to know what we believe and why we believe it and why it's real. We need to know the story of reality because there's objections to what we believe and we need to be able to reply to those things. Now, we're not going to get through all of this today by any means, but most people in our world would agree today that something has gone wrong. You can't read the news. Well, who reads a newspaper? Sorry about that. But you can't watch the news on television or you can't see whatever flies up on your computer and not realize there's something wrong in this world. You would have to admit this is not a perfect place to live. Now, I really like living in Taiwan, but I can tell you that Taiwan people are just as messed up as other people. So we can, we can start and begin by saying, this world's messed up. Well, is that how it started? Is that how it started? I read a very interesting verse in the book of Hebrews. Uh, in I, I, Just a back story. Um, there's a reading program on, and anyway, there's a reading program out there someplace. It's reading the Bible in 60 days. You read from Genesis to the end of Revelation in 60 days. I said, I'm going to do this. I can do it because I don't have any kids. I can do it because I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> but I have to say that that's not why I did it, by the way. <laughs> but it was a challenge to read the Bible through in 60 days. Um, and frankly, it took less than an hour a day. And, and, and I'll just give you a little clue as to how you can do it. Because you can listen to the verbal, right? They'll read it to you. So you put the verbal on 2x. So it's reading it twice as fast. <laughs> but that really works because I'm reading it with my eyes. If, if it's going at 1x and I'm reading with my eyes, I'm going to sleep. It's boring. But when it's at 2x or even greater, it's following my eyes, it's leading my eyes along, and man, I'm telling you, I'm picking it up. And it was great. And, and it, was, it was really great because you get, a, you get a vast perspective of what's going when you read that whole book, it's amazing. And I, I wasn't concerned about details, so when it's telling you the genealogy and the names and somebody begat somebody and somebody begat somebody and it goes on chapter after chapter, you can zip through that pretty quick, all right? But you get a perspective of the whole Bible going through there, and I'm coming through, uh, getting towards the end, coming to the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews, there's a chapter in there, verse uh, chapter 11, it's called the faith chapter. And I don't know how many times I've read this book, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, gone through the faith chapter. But I read something in Hebrews chapter 3. It's not on the slides. This is completely extra. So, <laughs> so um, because I read that and I said, I, am, I, I believe the same thing that every scientist believes. I can see from this verse, there is no conflict between me and a scientist. We, we would agree on this. And, and I thought, wow, this is cool, man. I got to show this to my scientist friends because they need to see that we're Biblically, even in agreement. Okay, let me just read this real quick. It talks here about faith, and it tells us in verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Verse 2, For by it the people of old received their commendation. Now, check this out, verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. In other words, what is seen was made out of things that are invisible. Can we agree on this? Can we agree on this? I mean, the whole argument is, how do we get something out of nothing, okay? And, and the, with the physicists, they're going through all, they're jumping through all kinds of hoops and jumping through fiery hoops and the whole thing to come across with this thing that 
that, that, uh, that it's possible for something to be made out of nothing. And, and, and how should I say this nicely? But somebody with no education looks at them and goes, you're kidding. You can't make something out of nothing. And so, but my Bible says that you can. Can I read it again? All right. It says, by faith, we under understand that the universe, what? Was created by the word of God. Now, that's the stumbling point. That's where we choke. That's where we have this, oh, no, by the word of God. But if you take that out, it, which, which an atheist would, or, or, or many, uh, uh, um, yeah, which an atheist would, would say, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. I totally agree with that. What, where we're going to have arguments, the thing about God. The reason I say that is this, is because without God, it's very difficult to have a reasonable and rational worldview. Because eventually you're going to have to go back to the beginning. And when you get back to the beginning, you're going to have to ask the question, where does this all come from? I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but I just wanted to say that, that it would be good for us to read the Bible, to read it all the way through, because it's a story of our reality. And we, in this reality, we need to know how to respond to objections. Most people agree something is wrong. Not hard to agree on, okay? So we also would have to say that, listen carefully, getting rid of God does not solve the problem of what's wrong, does it? Does it? And this is one of the arguments that's used against people of faith is saying that if there was a God, then he would fix the things that are wrong. Well, I might say to you then, if there was no God, then why is there anything wrong? This idea, or, or this thing is, leads us to this conclusion. If what we have is a godless physical universe, the idea that things are not as they should be makes little sense. It just doesn't make sense because how can something go wrong when there was no right way for it to be in the first place? It just happens by, it just happens. Okay, so that's one objection that we have, and this is why we need to have a worldview that, and in our worldview, begins with God. Take God out of the picture, we've got some serious issues. And actually put God in the picture, we still have some issues because if we're like Job, <laughs> we have to deal with those things too, all right? So, uh, but there's another thing here too that we have to deal with, and that is this. If there is a heaven, how can I know I'm going to get there? Why do only Christians get to go there? Why do I have to be a Christian to be the one who gets to go there? So, we as Christians with this worldview are accused, are accused of being, and rightly so, of being small-minded, tribal, exclusive in our claim that only believers in Jesus get into heaven. However, this is not my idea. It didn't start here. It didn't start with you. This didn't even start with Jesus. This idea didn't come about through Christians. This idea originated way back in the prophets of the Old Testament, the teachers of the Old Testament, because God had given them a way to live, and God had, in, in, in Jewish uh, tradition and history, God had come and said, I want to live with my people, and that's why the tabernacle and why all the, the um, uh, ceremonies and sacrifices and things to, for purity and holiness and so forth because God's a holy God. It's Jesus, though, who also makes the claim, though, I'm like that lamb that has to be spotless. I am that spotless lamb that you have to have that has to be given in order that sin can be forgiven. So we have this thing on the one side, why, is it, why are things so bad? On the other side, then, why do bad people not get to go to heaven? And here's the thing, these two objections actually are part of our story. And it's in our story that 
the brokenness of the world, which is the first objection, and the exclusive claims of Jesus, which is the second objection, they're connected because it's only through Jesus that our broken world can be redeemed. It's why only Jesus is the answer that makes complete sense in our story of reality. It's why we call ourselves Christians. So, because these two objections then uh, actually come together to answer the, the questions of our story, they're a part of it. We have to have them. So why do, why do we believe the Christian worldview then? I'll tell you why I, I, I believe it. Um, I believe it because it's the closest to reality. It explains why we live in a broken world. It explains that the world didn't, didn't used to be broken, but now it is broken. The story of reality, a, a, a worldview, explains then that God wanted to make it right. He gave his own, he gave Jesus to pay the price, to bring redemption. So we, we, we have a, a fall. We, I mean, we have a, a world that was created. We have a fall, which is obvious. We have the redemption. But then we also have the promise of restoration. It's going to be made right. So let me read you this uh, paragraph here, which if, um, th this is great. In fact, is I think, I think that uh, I would memorize this paragraph as being my story in a, in a nutshell, in a paragraph. Our story starts with God. He created everything from nothing, including the most valuable thing in all creation, man. But something went terribly wrong. And human beings got themselves into a lot of trouble. So God initiated a rescue plan. He entered the world he created by becoming a human being just like us. His name is Jesus. To rescue us from our problem, Jesus did something utterly unique that culminated on a cross. How people respond to what Jesus did will determine what will happen to them at the final event of history, the last resurrection. So, if somebody wants to ask you your beliefs in a paragraph, bam, put it out there. Then you can open up the discussion. The discussion will start right from the beginning because it starts with God. But if you take God out of it, then <laughs> what have we got left, okay? There, the, the, if, you're a, if you're a writer, if you love novels, if you love good movies, these are the parts of a good story. The parts of a good story, there's always a beginning. It starts someplace. One of my favorite stories is the Lord of the Rings. I think it's a great, great book. Uh, another one that I think has, would be very appropriate is uh, The Matrix. The, the, the Matrix, is it a trilogy? I think it's a trilogy. Yeah, I, those things are fascinating. Anyway, but there's a beginning, right? There's a beginning to it. What happens is a conflict arises. It happens in every love story, okay? There's a lovely beginning, then there's a conflict that happens, and, and it, things begin to break down, and this, again, guess what happens? There's conflict resolution, and the, things come back together again, and uh, the, the great white wizard comes back, and the armies go f forward, and they knock out the, the great eyeball there, you know, and, and uh, good wins, good wins. And so the ending is they all live happily ever after. That's the ending. They all live happily ever after. And it makes for a good story, doesn't it? So these are the essentials, then, of a solid worldview, a creation. Where did we come from? A fall. What happened? How come things are so messed up? A redemption and then a restoration. And this is what, this is what I... I want us to be able to understand. I want us to be able to articulate this and to be able to do it in our own words. Why, why do we need to be familiar with this biblical view or with this Christian story? Because a good worldview will answer questions. 
A good worldview will answer these questions. Origin, where did we come from? Identity, what am I? Who am I? Am I, a, am I an animal? Am I simply a, a machine, a computer machine? With, and, and it's all the, the data of the DNA and the past, everything that's been come down and, and it's all filling me up and I'm just responding to, to data? Is that, is, I'm, am I simply a machine? What about meaning? What is living about? What is the purpose of my life? A good worldview answers questions with regard to morality. How should we live? Is morality based on feelings? Is morality based on my inclinations, my desires? And destiny, what's next? What's next? So I have a question for you. If we all began with a big bang, how's it gonna end? You need to read the story. It's a great story. It's the story of reality. A good worldview will be true to reality. Now, uh, I had planned on bringing um, a list, a book list, and putting them up on the screen so you could see what the book looks like and so forth. But I'll, I'll do that uh, next week. Um, and I'll tell you that this book, or even what I've been talking about, the story of reality, it's the title of a book that's written by a guy named Greg Kukul, K-O-U-K-L. It's called The Story of Reality, How the World Began, How It Ends, and Everything Important That Happens in Between. Now, <clears throat> I'm putting a lot of it into my own experience and so forth, but I do highly recommend it, because here's why. Our world needs someone with higher authority than us. Would you agree with that? Otherwise, we're just gonna argue. We're just gonna we're just gonna fight. Who are you to tell me what to do, right? We're equals. That's what our Declaration of Independence said. But if we've been endowed rights by our Creator, ah, okay. Now there's a higher authority. Our world needs a higher authority. The problem with governments when they try to be secular. It never works. You know why? Secular governments have no basis whatsoever to determine morality. Therefore, in a secular government, morals, whatever you want to do, it's okay. For the government here in this country, then uh, when in the conversation whether or not there's going to be same-sex marriage, of course, of course. A secular government can't say yes or no to that if that's what you want to do. You have rights <clears throat> in a free government like this to the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. If you would like to marry your dog, who's to say in a secular government? You see what happens? There's no authority other than a group of people getting together and saying, this is what we decided. So, who are you to say what's right or wrong? What government has a right to say what's right or wrong? We elected you. So without a higher authority, folks, whatever goes, goes. And we, and this, this is very crude, I understand. Uh, it's tragic that 11 young lives were taken because a guy was angry and had a gun and just wanted to shoot people. I mean, as far as we know. I think it's tragic. But hey, if there's no God, their life is meaningless anyway. And he only found meaning in his life in shooting other people. You, you, you see, we can talk and all we want to about this, that, and the other thing about why it shouldn't be done and how terrible it is and you can't take another person's life. Where do you get the authority that says that if we're the final authority? And, and here's the thing, though, that uh, the reply to that question is there's a majority of belief. There's a majority um, agreement to certain morals and rules and so forth. Have you ever experienced the majority being wrong? 
just because there's a majority, does that ensure perfection and purity and goodness? All you need to do is visit a country like Germany many years ago. I don't know that that was the majority rule, but I know that the majority of government determined that that's the way it was going to be. Is the opinion, uh, is, are the elite, the educated, the wealthy, the powerful, able to determine unalienable rights or moral behavior? This is a question that's going across the United States now, and they're dividing up the, the, the electorate between white male uneducated and white male educated. And according to some newspapers, they're making a, a judgment call as to you have to be white male and educated to make the right choice for elections as to who you want to represent you. And if you're white male and uneducated, then you really don't know how to make the right choices. I, I get so sick of this stuff. Honestly, I get so sick of this stuff. Because if you don't know Jesus, I don't care if you have an education or not, you're not making the right choice. You're just not making the right choice. If there's no God in your life, if there's no higher authority, if there's no higher calling, if there's no, no higher motive or direction, who cares who you are? No, no, I don't, I don't mean it like that. I don't mean it, honestly, I don't. I, I got carried away saying that. I, I care, <laughs> I really do. <clears throat> but I'm simply saying, in, in our thinking, we have to be careful. Um, and then also there's this question, are scientists better equipped to be a higher authority or a moral authority? I, I had a quote that I wanted to give, but we'll, we'll just uh, uh, move on with that. The answer is, without God, I don't, it doesn't matter how much you know or how educated you are, there is no higher authority then we need to yield to God. A very, wise <clears throat> a very wise man gives us this advice. He says um, in, he wrote this proverb, and in the proverb he says, trust in the Lord. He says, do it with all your heart. In other words, be committed. All in, trusting the Lord. He goes further to say, don't depend on your own understanding. Seek his wisdom. Seek his understanding. In all your ways, in all your journeys, in all your decisions, in all the things that you decide to do, look to God. Look to God. Acknowledge his lordship, his kingship, his sovereignty. Acknowledge him. Seek his wisdom. And you know what happens? It says there, he makes the road straight. I like a straight road. He makes the road straight. It means this. He can take the confusion out of life. He can take the back and forth and ups and downs. And he will answer the why. Why? He has the answers to the why. Seek him, yield to him. Let's pray, shall we? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much that in your wisdom, you gave us uh, your word. And Lord, help us to be wise in the words that you give to us. Help us to be thoughtful. Help us to be thinking believers and, be to, and to be believers who think, to ask questions, to seek answers from you. And Lord, there's no, help us not to be afraid to ask questions. Help us not even be, to be afraid of even having doubts. It's those doubts that, that can test us and try us and, and help us to find uh, the truth. I ask you now, Lord, that as we continue this journey, as we continue looking at these things, that you, you would uh, strengthen us in a solid understanding of this world where we came from, what happened, what you've done to, to redeem us, and what we had to look forward to. And Lord, 
strengthen us in a worldview that can answer the questions that this world has for us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please. Let's stand. We're going to sing this chorus together.